These questions are designed to unfold and explain the teachings of Ramana Maharshi as, as set out in his original booklet, Who Am I? <coughs> and Self-Inquiry. And I believe them to be coming from the ancient Indian tradition. So the first question is, um, Ramana proposed the fundamental question, Who am I? Who are you? <laughs> well, I'm your ghost. <laughs> in the female version, you know, <laughs> Pramananda, Pramananda, well, that's what we, we call ourselves by a name. And uh, I think the question needs to be looked at, uh, at, which, at which level of reality we, are, we want to answer. <clears throat> there is a transactional reality in uh, living a human life and there are basic metaphysical realities. So when it comes to the ordinary, the transactional reality, yes, I'm Swamini Pramananda <laughs> in this female form and a name given to me by my guru, Swamidhyan and Saraswati. <coughs> if you're exploring the, the fundamental question, who am I? Then you have the answers in Maharshi, Ramana Maharshi's book. Is that clear okay. enough? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Many Western seekers come to India looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? becoming light in life, I suppose, you know, because we all seem to be carrying so much weight on our shoulders. I would say, <clears throat> knowing oneself, the basic inquiry of why a human being is here in the human life, what life is all about, what living is all about, <clears throat> where one is off to when one drops the body, how does one fulfill one's goal of having taken this human life. I suppose one who has been able to access <clears throat> the, the truth that gives us answers to this fundamental human search, um, one who has accessed that truth is considered to be an enlightened soul. <clears throat> so I wouldn't say just Western seekers are looking for enlightenment. I think all humanity is looking for some basic answers in life. Many of them don't even know what they are looking for. <laughs> and in a simple a language of the ordinary human being. He would say, I'm just looking for happiness. If you ask anybody, what is it you're looking for? Mm -hmm. The answer is, I'm looking for happiness. <clears throat> Whatever I do, I basically want to be happy. And so, uh, when we... I don't think a one seeking enlightenment is looking for anything different. He is also looking for happiness. So whether I can articulate it in so many words, <clears throat> whether I know it or not, I think every human being's human heart is in search of that, that free person inside. And where do we go when we leave our body? <laughs> <clears throat> I don't see that as a related question. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit tempting. <clears throat> uh. <clears throat> well, the uh, scriptures and I think also the New Age spirituality, spiritual world, talks about 
an individual's journey being an ongoing process, a soul, a jiva, whom we call a jiva in Sanskritam, the word soul, <coughs> I would say a jiva, J I V A, jiva. I'm, I do not, I do not wish to use the word soul because I do not know the other connotations of that word. It's not an Indian word. And so that soul has certain image in individual's mind. <coughs> because I'm told certain philosophies don't consider animals as having souls. And so this, I do not wish to use that word because when we say a jiva in my mind, a jiva is an individual. A, a, uh, an embodied being. An embodied being is a jiva. <clears throat> and that's all there is to it, an embodied being. And so this embodied being who's embodied in a human body, <coughs> um, we talk about the journey of an embodied being is not just taking life in one body. The journey, this is uh, one of the many births we have taken and we are, it's a, it's a journey of a jiva. <laughs> you change bodies, like changing a house which is old, which can't function anymore, which leaks, which, <laughs> which has problems and you change because it's no use to you anymore and so drop a body and pick up another one. So similarly the jiva also, time comes when he takes this on, a new house, a new rental and then when time runs out, when the lease is over, <laughs> you move on to pick up another one. And the question then is, what is it that he accomplishes? And is there a order, is there a system in which he travels, is there a law, is there a method about his journey? And the method is defined in the law of karma. We talk about the method as being a person who has made intelligent choices in his life, uh, grown as a human being, matured as a human being, this person who has done good in humanity moves on for better lives. One whose actions have been disturbing the cosmic order, disturbing the peace and harmony around him or in himself, one who is incapable of really, really what you call adding anything to society, but there to take away. This person, this disturbed soul in other words, disturbed jiva, when he moves on, he is not going to have a more exalted body than the current one. He is given a body appropriate to what he is capable of. So if he's been barking all his life, for instance, you know, in his human life, <laughs> if he's been barking, he's been shouting, he's not able to be human, been more animalistic in his, in his pattern of life, there's less chance that he would come back as a human being because his core person is more... <laughs> more familiar with the animal patterns than human. <laughs> <laughs> We'd expect he's a dog, I guess. So I didn't want to <laughs> say that, but, <laughs> but something, something which is appropriate to where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. But generally they say that having taken a human birth, a human being is given more chances again and again to improve his life. Unless he really messes it up. <laughs> Once, I mean the very fact that one has come up to human life, 
That means he has had the capacity to discriminate, to do good, to be able to move, his, take his life further up to the next level. And he, if he is not able to, then alone he goes back down. Otherwise, the journey is a journey upward. The scriptures say, Durlabham trayame vaitat deva nugraha haitukam manushyatva mumukshutva maha purusha samshrayaha. This is a little bit of Sanskrit for your ears. <laughs> it's a traditional text which says there are three things in life very difficult to, to find. One is manushyatvam, to find, uh, to, to, to get a life of a human being is very tough. Okay. And I will explain that in a moment. Because otherwise you will ask me, you know, well, it seems very easy in India <laughs> because this country is overpopulated and what, what's the big deal in being born a human? That's not what I mean. A, a human birth is where one, one has learned to live like a human being, not like an animal. <coughs> one who can live a human life and what that means, I'll come to it in a minute. But that human life, human living is considered to be rare. The second rare thing is this desire to know the truth. <clears throat> One can be a good human being, a simple good human being. But then he can be contented with that, relatively speaking. But if this good human being has a mind which is in search of deeper answers, which sees himself as, as one related to the cosmic being, wanting to know the relationship between the individual and the total, and is in search of these fundamental answers. That is called mumukshutvam, the desire to know the desire to understand metaphysically what this world creation is all about, what am I all about. So that is a second rare uh, quality to find. And the third is having discovered that search in yourself. There are many who are searching but how many have been able to arrive at the right answers? There are so many seekers, you know, good people who are in search of some wisdom, some truth somewhere. And how many of them have been misguided <laughs> in the name of spirituality? And so to find a master, a teacher, a guru who really can give you the right direction, take you back on to yourself is a third very, very extremely rare, rare situation. And one who has all three in one's life, Manushyatvam, Mumukshutvam, Mahapurusha Samshrayaha, you know, birth of a human being, this desire for self-knowledge or knowledge of the Lord, and number three, a master, a guru, one in whose life these three have come together, he is very blessed soul, you know, that is what <laughs> is said. <coughs> and uh, groups like yourselves, you are people who, it doesn't take much to know that you are spiritual people people who are looking for basic answers in yourself. You have come all the way around the globe to spend some time in a land known for its spiritual wealth. And so that, that is with you. And you have a person in the middle amidst you as one of you, source of your inspiration, who can guide, 
who, who takes you to right places, right situation. So I would say you have all three blessings with you. Really. <laughs> <laughs> you can come again. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to ask, uh, it fits quite nicely now, even yeah. though we went around a little. Yes. Um, are there any qualifications for enlightenment? Is sadhana necessary? And if yes, what form do you advise? What form of qualification? Of spiritual practice. <clears throat> I would say any knowledge uh, requires qualification. You know, we always have when we want to enter college, we have these prerequisites, you know. They call them the prerequisites. Unless you cover the prerequisites in your credit courses, you are not even given admission <laughs> in, in the universities. It's something like this, that self-knowledge is no different. Self-knowledge is knowledge after all. It's working with, your, with yourself, knowing yourself. And like any knowledge, there is prerequisite. Very simple, you know. When a teacher talks to you, when your guru speaks to you, you should be able to understand the language. No. I must at least, pre one prerequisite is, I must have the language in which he talks. It should be, I should be able to hold the teaching. Capacity to, for attention, is it not? Capacity for assimilation. And sometimes capacity to be able to re-articulate what has gone in. So that in my own articulation, I, I gain clarity to what I thought I understood. Teaching is a great way to discover your own vagueness or your clarity, you know. When somebody says, explain something, and you start to explain, that's when you recognize how vague you become. And then we say, no, no, I didn't mean this. No, no, I did not mean that. <laughs> you understand what I mean? You keep, because the, the, what is up here needs to come out. And unless what is up here hasn't reached your heart, it doesn't come out well as it should. And therefore, basic, like language is a basic prerequisite. Similarly, since self-knowledge is, 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 is the wisdom we seek to know, is the wisdom that we seek to discover happiness, it's connected to one's happiness. And the self that is talked about in the scriptures, in Ramana Maharshi's teachings, however we have understood the self, the self is not the physical body, the self abides in this form. The body is looked upon as inert matter, the self is consciousness reflecting in the physical body, then the body and its attributes cannot be the attributes of the self. When I say I live in a house and the house is leaking, doesn't mean I am leaking. <laughs> I hope <laughs> I am clear, you know. If I live in in a structure, whatever happens to that structure doesn't happen to me. I am different from the structure. And therefore, the form of the structure is not my form. The attributes of the structure is not my attributes. So too, when the self is not the physical body, the attributes of the physical body doesn't belong to the self. 
and when this is the fact that is the reality if my life is oriented towards a lot of body consciousness i am i am too identified with my body if my self image is dependent on the on the body look look of the body the color of my hair the color of my eyes the color of my skin if i am very body conscious that means you know my pursuits in life are more materially conscious pursuits materials that keep my body comfortable my whole orientation becomes external in other words if my orientation is external i am not really ready or available to go inward going inward means being able to suspend my pursuits for the physical body and therefore a prerequisite in spiritual life has been over you know different religious groups also is suspending the external pursuits this living in a consumer society you know being drawn into being captivated by the media the ads and so on that kind of a life is not the prerequisite for self knowledge in other words it has to be a life of relative withdrawal capacity to be able to discriminate between the permanent and the impermanent searching for the permanent means i must be able to spot the impermanent when self knowledge when we are looking to know looking to understand to the oneself that means i am looking for the permanent is it not permanent something that is not temporary something that won't go away from me self is one that doesn't leave you because you are the self and the self is said to be the source of happiness now if i am committed to external sources of happiness i am not available for the true source and therefore very naturally a very important prerequisite for self knowledge is the capacity to be able to discriminate between the permanent and the impermanent and once i have discriminated then i i pull my life away from the impermanent and pull it towards the permanent this two prerequisites is called viveka and vairagya in sanskritam in english we say capacity to discriminate between the permanent and impermanent is viveka and dispassion from the impermanent is vairagya these two are two important prerequisites that we talk about the third prerequisite is becoming that human you know that first point i mentioned being human so one's own growth the emotional growth of a human being emotional growth means being a good person in my thought word and action i am aligned i don't victimize people in my anger against myself against the world against god i can contain my emotional life i have a relative mastery over my emotions i have a capacity to reflect an intellectual honesty a commitment to be a better person to grow to forgive to accommodate all this comes under one qualification one prerequisite so we are looking now at three viveka 
vairagya and the third is inner qualities person who is relatively kind can discover the nature of the self as being all kindness one who is relatively compassionate is equipped to discover the nature of the self being all compassion one who is relatively angry <laughs> cannot is not ready to discover the nature of the self as being all accommodating understand this well and therefore mm. the third prerequisite is being a mature adult working towards inner maturity and so viveka vairagya samadhi shatka sampatti and mumukshutvam mumukshutvam these are the four tradition talks about prerequisite as being fourfold discrimination dispassion the inner maturity and the desire to know the self one who's working with these four prerequisites is one who is ready for self knowledge one who has adequately prepared himself with these four requisites prerequisites is one who is ready for self knowledge <coughs> that is how tradition describes and do you suggest any practice that can help <coughs> the achievement of those prerequisites i would say a life conducive to to knowing what is permanent and impermanent you know conducive therefore you know being with like minded people if my friends are very worldly <laughs> that's not you know first creating a support group in other words creating a support group that can nurture this this what you call similar thinking people and i would say a life of learning life of self reflection a life of quietening down quietening the mind simplifying the mind settling accounts minimizing my transactions with the world keeping it minimum not packing the day with a million things to do <laughs> it's endless it's end the, the world, sky is the limit for what all we need to do you know so unless i do all this i cannot sit <laughs> but by the time you do all this it's time to sleep <laughs> you can still not sit because <laughs> we are too tired doing the to be dones in the day and therefore minimizing the not packing the the best time of your life with too many activities being more prayerful because my search is to know the self and the self that i seek to know happens to be no different from the cosmic self and therefore my a certain prayerful attitude towards myself in connected with the cosmic self uh does bring me closer to that quiet mind that is so essential for this knowledge so i would say doing what is appropriate for for all this to come together i noticed that in many indian ashrams yes they have something called karma yoga yes which usually means hard work well unfortunately it's <laughs> it is uh, it is it does not mean hard work <laughs> uh in fact it does it has nothing got to do with work 
Karma Yoga has nothing got to do with work. I'm sorry to say this. It has everything got to do with attitude towards work. It's not about packing your day with work. It's about what attitude you carry when you do work. And for which you don't have to sit in an ashram <laughs> to do Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga, wherever there is karma, there is yoga. <laughs> as that, you know. Because Karma Yoga is an attitude towards, towards how I handle the results of action. How I handle life situations. How I handle the very doing of an action. You know, either things can happen through me or I, I, what do you call, I make things happen, you know. Making things happen and tuning into things happening. <laughs> And you just, you know, it's like the pot maker. You know, the, the pot, when, when you put the right material on the wheel and have the right spinning, a pot maker here, <laughs> okay? <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> I hope I have to be careful in what I say, she'll correct me. <laughs> So you just, you just give the right mold, you just allow it to happen, is it not? You don't, you don't do much except you are there to make it come together. The, the thing keeps moving on its own. The, the, the work you do is you are a facilitator, you know, you help it come together. In other words, you tune in your actions to a momentum that is already set. You tune your action into a motion which is already set, moving. You don't, you don't cut through that motion. You fall in line with the motion that is already set. When we have come into this world, we have all come with our own karmic package. And that karmic package is unfolding in our lives as our destiny through our relationships, through our loved ones, through our hated ones, through all these intense emotions that we go through. through in the land, we have karmic connections to land, to people, to animals. I'm sure I have some karmic connection to all of you, because I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> You wouldn't be here today. And so we are all connected. And a person who is in touch with his own, his own the karmic unfoldment of his life, he also does work. But he uses his will and effort to be that pot maker. The thing is already in motion. Why not I use my choices to fall in line with what is in motion rather than, rather than push and pull and have bl blood pressures and get stressed out and what not. You know, this, this kind of a fight we have with our karma, it's like fighting with shadows. Karma yoga is that attitude in action where I am so graceful about what I do that I don't even really do. <laughs> I find myself just a facilitator in what is already happening. There is a knack, there is a beauty, a grace about handling life situations with that attitude towards karma. Similarly, when the karma results come to me, Every action has a result. That's law of karma. Law of karma is twofold. Or everything that you do has a result. Number two, the result that you gain 
is in keeping with the action done. And so if you lift your leg to place it in front, this is a step you have taken forward. The result is you, are, you have walked ahead. <laughs> the result will not be that you would go back, you would be ahead. So the action you do has a result and number two, it is in keeping with the action done. And therefore, the results when they come to me, every result is again twofold. One is seen and the other is unseen. This is how karma defines. If I do good to a person, there is a seen result, you know, I, I give charity, help somebody, poor person. There is a seen result. Seen result is, my pocket is empty, <laughs> you know, <laughs> very visible. And his pocket is full. He is happy, I am happy, I could help. This is called an experienced result, a seen result. Every karma also has simultaneously an unseen result, which is not, which is not seen. It is, it is not fructified. It goes into your account, into the cosmic karmic account. And if it is a good action, we call it a good unseen result called punyam that goes into your credit, you know, an FD account. <laughs> it's an FD. If it's a bad action, a wrong action, you get a seen result, you know, you go to jail. And the unseen is credited to your account called Papa, Punya and Papa. You know what they translate as sin, but I do not again want to use not knowing the exact connotation of that word. Punya and Papa, the good unseen and the good and the bad unseen results which have gone into your FD. At a future date it would fructify, mature, you know, the FD would mature. And that future date can be in this life, need not be in this life. So if if I'm while I'm doing a good action, if the bad FD fructifies, matures, understand? You don't see the result of your good action, you know, you get a slap. <laughs> Sometimes you do good to people and then they pull the carpet from under, you know, they hurt you. You don't see. But it's not that you don't see, you are, you are getting in life what you have put in. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the attitude towards karma yoga is, towards result is, that capacity to accept the results of the action when they come to me. Not that I don't expect always the best. I expect and I work for it. But what will come to me in life, I do not know. But when it comes, whatever comes, I trust the cosmic justice. I know that the law of karma will not fail because it's a law, like law of gravity never fails, law of karma never fails. I trust that so totally that I can receive the results of action with grace. Understand that attitude towards action, attitude towards the result of action, which takes into account the cosmic order, the cosmic law, the cosmic justice, one who has brought that into one's awareness, he is the one doing karma yoga. <laughs> is there a cosmic judge? A cosmic justice. Not judge. You don't need a judge when the laws are in place. <laughs> 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 Only with this violation you need judge. <coughs> you know. So karma yoga is an attitude towards action and its result. It's nothing got to do with packing your day with activity. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I understand from the scriptures.
I mean, what you're saying about this cosmic judging is quite interesting for Western people because somehow we've been brought up with the idea of a higher judge. Yes. God Almighty. And a lot of us are carrying inside us some kind of judge. We use this judge yes. every day, yes, usually yes, to judge yes. ourselves. Yes, yes, yes. Would you like to say anything about that? Yeah, that's very unfortunate, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, it is because, <laughs> you know, because by the time we discover what we are doing to ourselves, we are already half the life is gone, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the other half remaining, we need to undo with habitual patterns of thinking that's not easy and it's but I would say if one can if one can just be able to think you know think that when there is all power in the cosmos, if there is intelligence, cosmic intelligence, if the creation has been, if the creation as we understand is an intelligent creation, which we say it is, intelligent because it's predictable, intelligent because we can understand its patterns through the, through the life forms, through the season changes, through the geography, through the geology, through wherever you touch, whichever knowledge, piece of knowledge you take, it is all, creation is nothing but knowledge, is it not? I always tell when I go to these schools in India, you know, when I talk to children, there is a thinking, you know, that knowledge is in the book. <laughs> in my backpack, the geography, the arithmetic, the, the, the history, well, you know, all these, the science, the basic sciences, the biology, it's all in these books, knowledge comes in the books. <laughs> and it is a shift to understand that knowledge is not in the books, knowledge is right here, knowledge is in the creation. All that is here is knowledge. This tree grow, grows in intelligence. There is knowledge manifest here. There is knowledge manifest in this light. There is knowledge in the seasons. It's very intelligently placed when it comes, when it goes, when the seasons change, when there would be rains. It's all knowledge. Omniscience is not an entity sitting in heaven judging. Omniscience is, the creation is omniscient. The sun has omniscience because it does its job every day, intelligently, when it comes, when it goes. There is omniscience in the creation. Creation is omniscience. If creation is omniscience, then there is no entity separate from the creation called God. Omniscience is God. Creation is omniscience. Therefore, creation is God. You know. All that is here is God. All that is here is intelligence, the presence of intelligence. <coughs> In this breeze is Ishwara, is the Lord. In the air we breathe is the Lord. Is right amount of oxygen. <laughs> there is right right amount of carbon dioxide that comes out. Everything is balanced. There is right amount of temperature in the body. Fire is intelligence. Not too hot, not too cold. Too cold now you will be out. <laughs> too hot now you will be ashes. And therefore, everything in and around is nothing but knowledge manifest. If we can understand knowledge manifest as 
the Lord will take away all judge. There is nobody there to judge. There is no entity to judge. Then why should we judge? There is nothing to judge. There is something to live and own up. I own up the intelligence. I own up the omniscience. I own up the self. I own up the vastness. If I am not the physical body, because the body is inert, the mind also is made of the same five elements which is inert. All that we are looking at is omniscience manifest here in this physical body. Where is a question of an entity sitting there to judge and why would he judge? What for? If there is a good action I do, I will earn its result. If there is a wrong action I do, I will definitely earn its result. <laughs> it's all set up in the, in the laws. If I don't want to earn the result of my wrong actions, then I will do what it takes to rectify. I will grow. I will, I will, I will own up my mistake. I will learn. If I am committed to growth and learning, there is nobody to fear. Why should I fear anybody? Last of all, God Himself. He cannot be an entity I fear. If there is anybody who should understand me, is Him. <laughs> if He doesn't understand me, to hell with Him. <laughs> I don't need a God who judges me. I have had enough. You see, in fact, there is no God who judges. It is the laws that are at work. I am working with the cosmic order, the justice. The more I understand karma, the more I understand my relationship with karma, if that can gain a certain, if I can have those breakthroughs in, in my understanding of karma and my relationship to my own life situations, I can really relax in that order. I would say, one can really relax into the vast lap of the Lord. <laughs> you know, his arms are open right here. If he's looking, he's just say, come on, come in my embrace, that's Arunachala. Please, whenever I look at him, I always feel, he says, come on, you know. <laughs> that needs to be the, the omniscience message to us. Especially when he is all power and I am, my power is like power of an ant, you know. <laughs> what is my power as an individual? How can he, the big man, be judging me, the tiny toddler? And therefore, that's very incorrect. I need to drop it from my life. If I can just drop that, as it was one of those bad dreams I grew up with, and let it not influence the rest of my best years, coming years, I can open my heart to that trust, trusting the cosmic justice, you know. Do you have any tiny little technique that could help to drop this inner judge? <clears throat> I would say uh, meditations would help. Meditations would help. Meditations in which I I tell myself that I trust the cosmic order. I know when the omniscient being, when the all-knowing creator, let's call him omniscience, one who is all-knowledge. When we say he is all-knowledge and he takes care of billions and billions of his creatures on earth, 
and in the rest of his vast cosmos, his galaxies, when he can run such a big, big cosmos, huge universe is in his hands, in which me, a little soul, is not even a dot seen anywhere <laughs> in the cosmic vision. That, that is omniscience. He is handling the whole, it's like, you know, it's like the president of a country. He may be sitting in one place, but his powers extend through the, through the boundary of the country, is it not? He pervades, he pervades. In America, <laughs> your president pervades, <laughs> makes his pervasiveness very visible, you know. He pervades all over the country. Because his powers pervade. His powers pervade through his ministers, the ones who hold different portfolios. Similarly, the cosmic, what you call the, the omniscience, pervades his universe and he has his ministers <laughs> holding different portfolios whom he has empowered his ministers are the sun, the moon, the stars, the wind, the fire, the earth, all the elementals, all the elements of nature that influence your day-to-day -day life, that give you your life breath, that make this human life possible, are all because of the powers vested with these different elements. And that omniscient, intelligent being who has so much order in his creation, everything works with laws as we have studied in school. And therefore, he also has, is looking out for me, the little one, little jiva. Along with billions of jivas that he takes care of, I am also one in his hands and therefore let me learn to receive him as my, as my what you call guide, as my parent. Let me open my heart to receiving him as my healer. Let him manifest in me as divinity manifest in this body, let my life expressions not be away from the divine. This form of a meditation in which I receive the cosmic energy into myself, living in the moment, can be a very beautiful healing, what you call process based in truth, <laughs> based in a reality. This is the final reality, you see. And therefore, if we can nurture meditations like this, in your, when you arrive at the deep level in yourself, if I can work with the mind, you know, in this manner, I would say, it can really help heal a lot. Apart from this, learning, learning to understand life situations, not, not in terms of why this is happening to me. Why me? You know, we have this why me business. This why me <laughs> is that victimized mind, you know. Instead, if I can, as part of my healing, understand that whatever has happened is happened. Now it's past. Let me today as an adult, when I'm not helpless, I am in charge of my life. I have choices I can make. 
I can be here or I can walk away. No one can stop me. I can do what I want. As an adult, I choose to close my accounts with people. Closing accounts means forgiving, accommodating. One thing I can only say in terms of what I do for myself, <laughs> if what I talk to you is what, how I work with myself. I'm trying to address this. One, as I said, meditations where we bring in the cosmic Maybe the cosmic light, you want to call it the cosmic light, the cosmic justice, cosmic omniscience, and work with that light to heal. Okay, this is one thing. The second thing I consider very important in our journey is what the scriptures say in, in India. I have taken that very much to my heart and I work with this and I find it very, very helpful that every human being that is born is born with certain debt, you know debt, D-E-B-T, debt. We have certain debts that we have come to clear. And in these debt, you, you, debt is something you clear, you know, you don't keep it going. <laughs> it is not the credit system, you know. It is something you clear your accounts, you have to close your accounts. So in the journey of the jiva, he has a lot of credit debit, you know. Sometimes we have taken so much from the world that we haven't you know, and the fellow keeps taking, taking and pops off. He has a lot he owes to the world. He has to come back to give back. There are some who keep giving, who take less, who probably won't return because there's nothing to give back. As part of the giving, they have grown out of the necessity for the world. Everybody comes to clear debts. And in human relationships, relationships that invoke very intense emotional life, you know, intensely, uh, a very intense relationships when we have, whether it's, it be with our parents or siblings or partners in life or friends, when they are intense, we need to understand there is an old debt <laughs> that is playing out. Old debt, in the sense, maybe I took something from this person. In this life, I have to give back. Or, you know, that's why you find yourself being more a giver than a receiver in a relationship. And no matter how much you give is not enough. <laughs> And you wonder why and you walk away from one relationship only to end up in a similar mess all over again, you know. Because it's not, not about the other person, it's about you having to clear the account. And therefore the clearing of debt is a very beautiful concept that helps me in, in, in accommodating people in outgrowing a relationship, in being kind, being human, in being sensitive to others and their weaknesses, their limitations. And with this, I even settle, internally I settle. There's no judgment here. I just keep working towards clearing my accounts with the world. And I personally, I have found this a very beautiful attitude uh, wherein you look upon every situation as a stage to, to give. Can I give here more than take? <laughs> if I can give and walk away, I'm free, you know. So that becomes an inner challenge and inner process of growth. I would say that could be another very beautiful, graceful way of 
handling relationships sometimes which are difficult that you can't get out of <laughs> that you're stuck in and you don't know what to do then you search for strengths in yourself to be bigger than the other i hope i hope i made myself clear is all part of the prerequisites understand <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we've nearly got to question 4 <laughs> question 4 uh. <laughs> right. okay, maybe i should shorten my answers <laughs> okay so um ramana said uh, self inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self what do you say about self-inquiry and how to conduct self-inquiry? <laughs> I'm sure Ramana said that too in his writings, no? He suggested yes, also. Can I know what, what in your understanding is Well, his that's also quite a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in, yeah. in your system of teaching, are you not usually there is nothing suggesting self-inquiry? There is nothing different from what Ramana said here. Mm. Um, he did... Uh, one thing we would... I mean, I, if I could add here is that Ramana Maharshi, we look upon him as a, a, a rare person, a rare soul, a Mahatma, who in his young age had had the he was himself able to know that he is not the physical body he outlives his body the body is gone he would continue to be this was something that came to him from a very young age without a master without any proper teaching and we would say Maybe that's because he had gone through the teachings before, in his past lives. He had already done a lot of work before. All he needed was to live some few years to live out his life of contemplation. And so self-inquiry in the tradition is talked about at, at, at three, is, it's a, a self-inquiry is a is a, uh, is a composite of three elements. The first is Shravanam. Shravanam means listening to the master, learning about oneself, learning about the self in a systematic manner. God is taught in the tradition. The nature of the Lord of the divine or the nature of the self both mean the same here is taught in a systematic manner there is a method of teaching structured teaching that we call shravanam which a guru gives you a teacher gives you when you go and live with a teacher as part of that learning when questions come up <coughs> like when we say, okay, if the self doesn't die, if there's no birth, no death for the self, then who dies? <laughs> what dies? You say, I'm not the body, but when the body, there is pain, I feel the pain. What does this mean? How do you reconcile what the mind understands and what the scriptures say? Does it, does it align, you know? When the scripture says something and my mind opposes, then I don't agree with the scriptures. So there is a second, second composite, second component, rather component. What the scriptures say, does my mind understand or flow with it? If it doesn't, then those questions are addressed by that very same teacher who teaches. 
This is called Shravanam Mananam. Mananam means reflections. So you learn and as you learn, you reflect. As you reflect and you, you don't understand, you again relearn. This is a process. The two components is a process connected with the teacher. You do it with the help of a, a proper guide. Having done this, having understood the, the nature of the self as scriptures tell, still in my life I may behave differently because I have some old patterns of behavior. It's like a bad habit, you know. You can't just drop it. <laughs> You know it's bad, but then you still smoke or do whatever or go this way or this way. <laughs> so certain habits are hard to draw because of habitual patterns. Similarly, body identification, they're all habitually, what you call, carried by the jiva through so many lifetimes. If I need to dissociate there, I require to materialize these teachings with the help of a contemplative life and that is called sitting in meditation, meditating, inquiring into the self or recalling the words of the scriptures you have learnt. This third component is called Nididhyasanam or Dhyanam or meditation. So in the tradition we talk about self-inquiry has three components. Shravana Manana Nididhyasana Two with the help of a teacher, Guru Third, by yourself And so Maharshi talked about the third because that's all it took for him He didn't need an external teacher So people think we don't need a person but I do not know whether I can make myself an exception to the rule like Ramana was an exception. Or if I am an ordinary soul, then as an ordinary person, can my tradition help me? Can my spiritual culture help me? Spiritual culture says, yes, learn, know through the proper teacher, reflect. The, on the word, stay with the Guru and once you have gotten, your mind can understand you have enough Viveka Vairagya you have covered all your prerequisites adequately and you have the teaching then this will definitely materialize in your life the third will be a walkover the third stage will be a walkover that's how that's how I understand and in fact, when he was asked, you know, who is your guru, he used to say Arunachala was his guru. Yes, yes. And he also advised people that it's useful to have a living guru. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, you know, yes. Mm. <clears throat> when Ramana was asked, when will the realization of the self be gained, he replied, when the world, which is what is seen, has been removed, there will be realization of the self, which is the seer. What is the true understanding of the world? How to remove the world? Removal of the world, the word remove itself, we need to be very careful in understanding. Because removal can mean absence of the world or it can also mean seeing the apparent nature of the world. Seeing that the world is apparent. If I understand my shadow as a shadow, not real, I need not remove the shadow. Because shadow cannot hurt me. If it's there, it's there, it's not there, it's not there. So, in other words, I have cognitively removed the world. 
remove the shadow. Even though physically I don't remove, cognitively I have removed its reality. Similarly, when we talk about, if I were to understand this in keeping with the traditional teachings, the tradition says Brahma Satyam Jagan Mithya Jeevo Brahmaiva Naparaha Brahma Satyam Consciousness is the truth Jagan Mithya Name and forms are apparent Are you name and form or are you the truth? The second half says Jeevo Brahmaiva Naparaha you are the truth that means not the name and form and so the name and the form is removed in other words it is apparent I don't give it a reality independent of the self removal of the world means you do not give the seen world a reality independent of the seer there is no seen minus the seer but there is a seer minus the seen even though when there is nothing to see the seer is not called the seer the seer is called pure consciousness pure consciousness gains the status of the seer when there is something to see so the removal of the world means removal of giving the world an independent reality. The world doesn't exist independent of the seer, the consciousness. The consciousness is the truth, the world is incidental. Whether it is physically seen or unseen is incidental but its reality is dependent on the consciousness, witness consciousness. That is how Vedanta teaches. It has been suggested that the mind must be destroyed for liberation to occur. Do you have a mind? Ramana used the term monanasa. Is it monanasa? Monanasa. Mononasa. Mononasa. Mano. <coughs> to describe the state of liberation. Mononasa, number seven. Six. Six. Yeah, Mononasa. Oh, Mononasha. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the spelling is wrong. Spelling is also wrong. Ah, okay. It is M A N O Mano Nasha. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to describe the state of liberation, meaning destroyed mind. How to destroy the mind? I, um, you know, his work, um, Upadesha Saram. I'll have to look up the uh, actual section. He talks about Mano Nasha versus um, there's another word he uses. Let me not make a comment without looking into this closely. Okay, yeah. It's a very because there are there are two expressions he does use and he does say um, okay let me not uh, make a statement here okay I would hold back on this okay. <laughs> because I don't want to be misread misquoted right well, it would be very so interesting I would, to have your answer yes later. I'd like to look into that section because I've studied in Upadesha Saram and then there is a commentary by that Swamigal um, 
who who wrote a commentary on Upadesha Saram in Sanskritam. Okay. So I remember when I was studying that commentary and those verses, he made a distinction between Mano Nasha and one more word is coin. And then he talks about the limitation of this expression and goes with the other. Okay. So I'll need to look up that section properly before I say say anything. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a mind? <laughs> <laughs> You have a mind. What, what is that statement to trick me into? <laughs> <laughs> no tricks here. You know, there, 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 is a, there is a sense that um, <clears throat> in achieving enlightenment, um, great saints, um, they don't really think. It just passes through. Yeah? And so there is a sense of there being no mind. There is no will. There is no purushartha. Because there is nothing to achieve, there are no choices to make. So passing through means, yes, like I said, that pot maker. Things happen, you are not the doer. The mind is a doer. The doer and the enjoyer is the jiva, is the mind, the person. But one who knows the self to be consciousness, consciousness is not the doer. It is akarta, abhukta. It's a non-doer, non-enjoyer. When I am a non-doer, then all that is done is done by the non-self. When the self is not the doer, hear me well, when the self is not the doer, all the doing that happens, happens by the non-self. And when the doing happens by the non-self, the doing gets done by prakriti, by nature, by the non-self. I remain a witness to all the doings, remaining a non-doer. We are looking at this metaphysically, at metaphysical level. And therefore, when we say consciousness is a non-doer, witness consciousness, the self is witness consciousness. It's not a doer. All doing belongs to the body-mind-sense complex. Therefore, the body-mind-sense complex does. The self is not a doer. The body-mind-sense complex enjoys, is a doer and an enjoyer, an experiencer. Atma is not an experiencer. The self has no experience. To experience, you require the body-mind-sense complex. And the body-mind-sense complex can only experience anything that it comes in contact with, which is also made up of the same elements. Body-mind-sense complex is made up of the five elements. The world is made up of the five elements. So the two can come into contact and there is experience. The skin can feel the touch, the eyes can see the form, ears can hear sounds. All the doing takes place at the non-self level. Self is not a doer. And therefore, when we say the saints or enlightenment means enjoying your non-doing state of being and things happen through the saints as you, you just expressed. What it means is they remain detached when doing takes place. If my I, sense of I, 
is placed in the consciousness, not in the body-mind, then all that the body-mind does, doesn't belong to me, the Self. That does not mean that the body-mind will not do, it will do what it needs to do. But the doing is not owned up by the Self, the Self remains a non-doer. Things happen, things get done, things happen. I, the Self, abide in the Self. There is no doing involved here. I am consciousness. In consciousness is this body. In consciousness is the creation. In consciousness is Arunachala. In consciousness are the stars. In consciousness is you, she. In consciousness is the whole, is, is, is the stars, the moon, the sun, the hills, the earth. In consciousness is the planets. In consciousness is the galaxies. All that is in, is in consciousness, that consciousness is the Self. Period, full stop, it ends there. There is no place for a doing or a do, being a doer there. There is nothing to be done. <laughs> All that is done is done. All that is to be done is done. So all the doing that takes place, takes place. It is not done by the Self. It is Prakriti, that is Mithya. All the doing is Mithya, it belongs to the body-mind complex, which is not the Self. Therefore it is apparent. The Self is Satyam. <coughs> what about Vasanas? Vasanas? Vasana? the tendencies of the mind. Mm -hmm. Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? Could it be enough to achieve a sattvic state of mind and to know one's vasanas so they no longer bind? How to remove vasanas? Yes. You know, the, the third stage of the third component of the spiritual life, self-inquiry, was nididhyasanam, dhyanam, what I call meditation. Meditating on what I have known about myself, so that my habitual patterns, before knowledge, whatever my habitual patterns were of body identifications, can be, can be falsified in light of my knowledge of the Self. Removal of the Vasana or, or working towards a state of mind where the Vasanas does not disturb me is, the, is that third component. We are just putting it differently. Vasanas can also remain as long as they don't disturb the quiet of the mind. The Upanishad says, Sa kashayam vijani yad sama prapta na vichala yed Sa kashayam vijani yad In your meditation when you sit and if there are certain things that come up you know, which happen, you know, like, like when you are sitting on the lake front and then you are watching the still waters and then suddenly one, you know, one bubble comes up and oh, <laughs> it just bursts out. Then again it is quiet. After some time another bubble comes up from the bottom and again it pops. What do you do? Nothing. Just watch. Remain, remain, remain unconnected or distance, just watch, be a witness. This is called Sakashayam Vijaniyad. I don't have to do anything to remove that bubble. It is all putrefied matter. 
that's coming up, you know. Similarly, vasana is the putrefaction, putrefied patterns of behavior that existed before self-knowledge. Some of it has not yet gone. It will go only after popping up. <laughs> Let it pop up. So what? I remain. I remain as a witness consciousness to whatever the play of the mind is. I don't judge it. I don't identify with it. I remain distant from it. That is how vasanas, the Upanishad helps us, give us these tips to work with the vasanas in Nididhyasanam. <coughs> and very often we do identify with them. Yeah. Most um, of the time. We identify, we judge, oh, we are still thinking like this, oh, I shouldn't be thinking like this. <laughs> Oh, why, do, why does the mind still remain disturbed? You know, Look at it. What is it that is disturbing it? Something like, you know, if there is a wound which is, which, is, which is not healed, it draws your attention through pain. If the wound did not pain, you won't even know. <laughs> Very soon, hand has to be amputated because you didn't even know there was a wound. It kept growing, there was no pain and you didn't take care of it. There was no extra attention given there. And next thing you know, the hand is gone because there was no way to know. So pain is a boon. Pain is a great blessing. In pain, I, my attention is drawn, telling me, mind telling me, hey, look here, you need to address this. You are hurting. Please see. There is some kashaya, there is some vasana, there is something there from the past. Look at it. And then I, I look, yes, let me see what is there to be looked at, what needs to be worked through. Instead of judging, hey, why are you there? Pain, you shouldn't be there. After 10 years of spiritual practice, you are still there. I walk away from my guru. <laughs> you know? He didn't work out for me. Get mad at him. <laughs> you didn't tell me my pain will continue even after 10 years of hanging around you. You know, you're a phony, you're the poor guru, you know. This is how gurus get into trouble trying to be kind. <laughs> because, because somewhere the blame has to go. I'm so angry that that is there. I'm angry because I have judged. I have decided it shouldn't exist. And it exists, therefore somebody is to blame. Of course, I can't blame. I can't blame myself. I'm the victim. So who's the next one you can blame? Where there is a safe person, kind person who can receive the blame. <laughs> when I'm little, it's my dad, my mom, and I'm older. It'll be this. This is the only unwise things gurus do, you know. Allow themselves to be sitting ducks for all transference issues. <laughs> That's the only place their wisdom, <laughs> wisdom we question, you know, why? <laughs> it's nothing to judge, it's something to, again, the knack of remaining a witness consciousness when kashaya or vasana mm. brings up issues. So in a sense you're saying, the vasana um, is there but has no harm if we are witnessing it. Yes. If it's still motivating our actions because there's no witnessing, then we are. Then a we need to look at that. it. We need to, we need to address it. <coughs> All we need to do is if it, we are not able to remain a witness, if we identify with it, if it brings out pain, if it brings out some other memories. Which, which disturb the quiet of my mind, then I need to come out of the meditation and address it. Look into it, write, do your journal work, do imageries, <coughs> recall the situation, try to, try to see where as a child, okay, this happened, but now as an adult, how can I save the situation? What can I do to close that <coughs> chapter? Clear my debt 
Rinam, close that chapter. What is it I can do? Would you advise? Therefore, therefore that process when I d go through it, because the mind attracted my attention to that pain, once I have addressed it, then you go back to the meditation, it will be more settled. It won't come back. So would you say that there are sometimes things, structures very strong, which would benefit from some kind of psychological therapy? Yes. Mm. I would say uh, psychological therapy, you can call it, you can even call it, you know, modern uh, Western world has, has really come up with some wonderful tools. I mean, I don't think we need to worry about only tools that the East has to offer. Today, Western world, with your, with your regressions, hypnotic regressions, past life regressions. We have so many methods. We have the, these meditations in the West, healing meditations, calling the white light, Reiki. These are little tools, but they are not that little. They do wonders. If I can, if I can work with them, you know, they do wonders. Brian Wise, others, they have done some some phenomenal research and results they have talked about. So some of our issues are not necessarily connected to this life alone. Sometimes it's not just about a therapy where you sit and go for counseling. It's connected to some core issues from previous lifetimes. Certain patterns, certain very vulnerable patterns of behavior. And so when you can address them through regressions, past life regressions even, you have cut through time, you know. You have accepted jiva as beyond this physical body. You cut through time. And the intelligence, in, inner intelligence, brings you back to those situations and helps you heal because you are ready for it. So there are tools today which can be uh, used and they do wonders mm -hmm. wonders towards healing mm. so um, a little bit of a technical question coming up at the end of his book self-inquiry Ramana says he who is thus endowed with a mind that has become subtle and who has the experience of the self is called a Jivan Mukta. Is this the state that can be called self-realized? And when one is immersed in the ocean of bliss and has become one with it, without any differentiated existence, one is called a V... I may get this wrong... Viha Mukta. Videha Mukta. Okay. It is the state of that word, but is referred to as the transcendental turiya. This is the final goal. Is this the state that can be called enlightenment? Is the first state residing in the mind and knowing the self, and the second residing in the self, observing the mind? I, th I think, in a sense, this question yeah. is coming out of the fact that sometimes um, in spiritual literature it talks about stages of enlightenment. Yeah, I would, uh, if I need to, if I have to interpret what he means, I'd like to be more equipped in looking at the context in which he said what he said, you know. Right. I wouldn't uh, make a comment on just a isolated statement. Okay. Because there is a context. Okay. And so, generally, how I, w I understand videha mukti, jivan mukti, and videha mukti are two expressions. Jivan mukti is one who has discovered the self as one with the cosmic self, as consciousness 
remaining embodied, remaining in the physical body is Jivan Mukti. Videha Mukti, the second word that I see there, tradition talks about it as this individual who has understood he is not the body-mind-sense complex and continues to live in the body, all right, so living he is a saint, we say, but once the body is dropped, then what happens to him? There we say he is a videha mukta. Videha mukta means videha. So vigataha deha, dehaha asmat. The body is gone from whom? That's called videha. So after death, in other words, after death, what happens to him? He is one with the total consciousness. This is how in the tradition the two things are talked about, Jivan Mukti and Videha Mukti. Here I see there is something else being said here in the second expression, Videha Mukti. Jivan Mukti is right when the mind is sattvic and the nature of the self is reflected in the mind. In other words, the mind does not disturb the person away from himself. He is a Jivan Mukta, that is clean. But the second um, statement, since my understanding of Videha Mukti word is in keeping with the tradition, what exactly he means, I need to study the context properly before I can I can explain this. Mm, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. And would you say there are any stages of enlightenment? They do talk about, uh, but again, that's an area I'd like to look into. I have not looked into in the scripturally what uh, uh, they talk about stages. I have not seen that in the Upanishads that I have studied or anywhere in the Bhagavad Gita. In the scriptural study, yeah. I have not seen the stages of enlightenment being discussed. But there are certain discussions in the tradition regarding the stages of enlightenment, different stages. And how that uh, reflects in the total picture, I have not, uh, I need to look into it before I, look into it very closely before I talk okay. about it. Okay. <clears throat> it appears essential to meet a guru and stay with that guru. Who is the guru? What is the guru's role? How to recognize a true guru? <laughs> Who is a guru? What is a guru's role? How to recognize? Okay, let's start with the first one. So, in your one question, there are three questions, okay, understand? <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> I take these questions seriously, you know. So, I have to answer each of them. Okay. Who is a guru? There is no guru, like there is no, there is no the guru, you know. There is no the father, the mother. A guru is a role a person takes for another individual who looks upon this person as a, who sees himself as a disciple to this person, you know. It's like a child who looks upon his parent as mom or dad. So can you, I cannot walk up to you and ask, are you mother, you know, <laughs> are you father? Are you the father? Are you the mother? Are you the guru? No. Because you are a mom to your child. Somebody is a dad to his child. So guru is a guru only to a person who sees himself as that individual's disciple. You know, there is no the guru as such. So this is one thing we need to know. Secondly, I would say, when you, when we talk about guru means what? There is a, 
the guru is a sanskrit word <coughs> gu refers to ignorance gukaraha antakaraha rukaraha tannivartakaha gu means ignorance ru means removal अंधकार निरोधित्वाद गुरु रित्यभिधीयते द वन हु रिमूव्स योर इग्नोरेंस इज अ गुरु पर्सन इज अ गुरु फॉर यू इफ ही कैन और ही और शी हैज बीन एबल टू रिमूव द इग्नोरेंस फ्रॉम योर लाइफ व्हाट इग्नोरेंस पार्ट इग्नोरेंस डांस इग्नोरेंस म्यूजिक इग्नोरेंस वेल अकॉर्डिंगली म्यूजिक गुरु डांस गुरु यू कैन हैव ट्रेडिशनली गुरु इज ए वर्ड गिवन फॉर वन हु रिमूव सेल्फ इग्नोरेंस राइट सो हु इज अ गुरु द रोल ऑफ ए गुरु इज टू रिमूव सेल्फ इग्नोरेंस इन अदर वर्ड्स गाइड दिस पर्सन गिविंग सेल्फ नॉलेज through shravana manana two components first two components how do you identify a guru third question right or part of one question <laughs> how <laughs> how do you identify that's what i ask you <laughs> how did you identify your guru <coughs> arjuna Actually, asks it's very interesting I mean, in my case, in the very beginning, my, I had two gurus. The first guru, I actually didn't like the look of him at all, <laughs> and I was kind of taken there against my will. I think, you know, my will would never have gone there, <coughs> and I was there, and then gradually I fell in love. <laughs> That's how. Guru is not, you know. <laughs> Arjuna asked this question to Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Who is a guru? He uses the word sthita pragna. How does he talk? How does he look? He didn't ask. Okay. <laughs> How does he talk? How does he walk? Sthita pragna se ka bhasha samadista se ke shava sthita dihi kim prabhasheta kim asita vrajeta kim. how does he sit how does he walk how does he talk you know so that i can measure him i can ide- identify if he walks in a slow motion <laughs> then i can say aha i caught him is <laughs> that <laughs> no, if he walks too fast na he can't be a guru you know so he asked this question and very interesting lord krishna's answer to him is he says प्रजहाति यदा कामान सर्वान पार्थ मनोगता आत्मन आत्मना तुष्टा स्थित प्रज्ञ तदा उच्यते दिस इज ए स्टेटमेंट लॉर्ड कृष्ण आंसर आत्मन आत्मना तुष्टा the one who can remain in himself by himself with himself contented he is a sthita pragna he is a wise man oh we can say well anybody can be contented in himself by himself for a period of time you know this statement says सर्वान मनोगता कामान प्रजहाति यहा हैविंग गिवन अप ऑल डिजायर्स बॉर्न ऑफ द ह्यूमन माइंड नॉट वॉन्टिंग टू फुलफिल एनी डिजायर्स डिजायर्स डोंट डिक्टेट हिज हैप्पीनेस वेदर फुलफिल्ड और अनफुलफिल्ड ही इज फ्री फ्रॉम देम वन हु कैन रिमेन इन हिमसेल्फ विथ हिमसेल्फ बाय हिमसेल्फ contented he is the wise man <laughs> that guru if at all he is your guru 
depends on if he chooses to teach you his wisdom therefore the question should be who is a wise man not who is a guru i'm sorry <laughs> question truly the question is the intent of the question is who is a wise man guru is one who teaches you it's connected to a disciple but wise man is someone who is connected to wisdom and wisdom that reflects in a person's life in this manner he is the one worthy to be asked to teach me to be my teacher so would you say that somehow when um let's call him the disciple when the disciple is ready that the guru then yes. appears yes that's what that's the that's part of the cosmic justice you know where a seeker is never let down by the cosmic law if i have staked my life into this if i have given up whatever my normal life quote and quote normal society normal living in search of truth in search of something deep that some <coughs> calling i don't know what is calling me i don't know where i am going <laughs> i don't know where will be my answer i don't know who will be around i don't know who will exploit my trust i don't know where i should trust these are all unknowns so many unknowns in the journey of a spiritual person is it not and every stage at any at any point i can be taken for a ride and therefore there is a promise given to us by the scriptures that when you are ready when you have worked on your prerequisites when there is true dispassion there is true discrimination there is a commitment to growth there is a commitment to forgiveness there is a commitment to prayerfulness this person will never be left hanging in life he will find his answers that right person will show up at the right time for you that has to happen that is the law that's part of the law you know so would you say the part of the law is also a kind of inner fire a kind of inner longing yes that brings somebody yes because that's the message you it's you know it's your it's your um, your core calling out in the universe to send somebody you're ready come on <laughs> send me my my fill me up your normal bluff won't work for me I've called your bluff oh lord <laughs> I've cut through cut through this bluff of life now give me give me what it takes to complete my journey and once that call is thrown into the cosmos it cannot not be answered because there is intelligence sitting there omniscience is sitting in the creation and that is picked up and right situations come up and take you to the right soul mm -hmm. there's no no doubt about this one should never have to doubt about this <clears throat> arjuna asked this question he had a doubt in the bhagavad gita why we all love arjuna because he sounds like us very often in the bhagavad gita he asked this question to the lord if i give up everything and take to this and what if i die का गतिम कृष्ण गच्छति इज इज क्वेश्चन इन द भगवद गीता सो आई नीदर मेड इट देर इन इन अ नॉर्मल लाइफ नॉट डू आई मेक इट हियर इन द स्पिरिचुअल लाइफ बिकॉज आई डेंट यू नो आई डेंट गेट द राइट ब्रेक थ्रूज का गतिम कृष्ण गच्छति वॉट विल हैपन टू मी इट इज समथिंग लाइक ही कंपेयर वेरी ब्यूटिफुल एनालॉजी ही गिव्स समथिंग लाइक ए क्लाउड यू नो मूविंग इन द स्काई and this whole cloud was moving and then this one little baby cloudlet moves away because it doesn't want to go with the group <laughs> wants to be different you know so wants to be part of a unique tribe you know 
and so he wants to move away and he moves away and Arjuna says what will happen to this cloud this goal is to reach the peak of the tip tip I mean what do you call it? the peak of the mountain and sit there but if on the way <laughs> on the way if it you know disintegrates then it's over neither could he but the big cloud ends up moving ahead this little fellow disintegrated what will be the lot of a seeker who has walked away from the normal you know the normal living and Lord Krishna answers to this he says he will he will never never lose anything even if he dies today <laughs> He will take his next birth and pick up the thread from where he left. In this spiritual journey, there is no restarting, reinventing the wheel. You have already come this far. And therefore, if today something happens to you, you will only pick up from here towards further on. But there is no, there is no such thing called... <laughs> There's only one way traffic, you know, there's no going back. <laughs> there's only one way traffic, yeah. You just keep on piling up the credits. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Another hour is okay? Yes. Another hour? Really? <laughs> <laughs> then I'll need a bucket here, you know. <laughs> uh, Ramana's devotees had tremendous devotion to him and he to Arunachala. Please say something about bhakti, devotion, in the pursuit of awakening. Bhakti, it's such a... It is a word... Devotion is a, is a word which... You know, which we all understand in our own ways. <laughs> For peop many people, devotion means singing bhajans, you know. But for if example, in the context you were just speaking, you know, um, something that happens in a way between the seeker and the guru. Yes. There is some element, kind of uh, invisible glue, you could say. Yes. And perhaps this is something to do with devotion. Yes. Yes, I would say uh, a, a similar relationship with the Lord. relationship of an individual with the total is a fundamental relationship of every human being you know of any creature anybody born anyone who has birth is an entity embodied entity <coughs> that embodied entity has a relationship with the total in whose laws this birth has taken place so the fundamental relationship of an individual is with the, with the creator, really. Devotion is, is that relationship with the creator which I never lose in my life, you know. Again, like karma yoga, we need to be alert. Devotion, sometimes bhakti or devotion is looked upon as an activity. Let's have some bhakti, you know. Let me sing some bhajans, sing some prayers, light a candle or a lamp. <laughs> or if you have a guru, go and <laughs> massage his feet, you know. <laughs> Imagine 25 disciples, you know, each one wanting to massage the feet. <laughs> guru become a pulp, you know, his feet become a <laughs> 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 so each one thinks bhakti in terms of an action many people think bhakti as an act an act of worship it begins as an act of worship but it doesn't end there an act is taken up in order to invoke a spirit behind the action Whenever you have a gesture, an act, you do, it is meant for a purpose, you know. For example, if I, if I give this rose to someone, 
when you give this rose, it's a, it's an act which has a message in it, isn't it? A form is used to carry a spirit, an emotion, a message. You know, you will not give a rose to your enemy unless you are trying to make up with the enemy. <laughs> Nor will you give a thorn to a friend unless there is some message hidden there, <laughs> you know. So, symbols, this, this is called sim symbolism, symbols. You use a symbol to carry your sentiment because sentiments are subtle. They require a form to carry to the other side. <laughs> Sentiments cannot be carried without a form. That's why many great friends, you know, many, many, many couples, <laughs> relationships fall apart because they could not share the basic sentiment that they love each other. They couldn't talk about that or they couldn't express, you know. To express something, you require a form. Bhakti, as an act of worship, <clears throat> forms are used in order to invoke a sentiment. In meditation nowadays, I find this in new age groups I have seen. You know, you light an incense, put on soft music, turn down the lights. All this is done. For what? To forget the world, <laughs> you know. But you are using the world to forget the world. Incense is part of the world. Music is part of the world. It requires electricity. It requires equipment. So, but then it creates an ambience. It creates the atmosphere that helps me go into myself. So, incense is not meditation. But it is a facilitator to carry me deeper. Bhakti used in different acts, these actions are meant to create a certain attitude towards the creator or towards an exalted being like Ramana Maharshi. Ramana Maharshi says, I have the devotion towards the Lord. <coughs> so you create an act in order to carry a sentiment. In knowledge, what happens is, in self-knowledge, what happens is, I don't need to create an action in order to carry my sentiment. When knowledge becomes my base, in self-knowledge, the Lord is included in my awareness. I don't need to create a ritual, an act, to carry my sentiment of devotion. I remain ever devoted. <laughs> knowledge does not go away, it remains. And in that knowledge, the sentiment floats, sustains. And therefore, devotion becomes an attitude. The sentiment becomes an attitude, not an action. Like karma yoga is not an action, but an attitude. Bhakti is an attitude towards the one whom you are devoted to. And in this case, we are looking at devotion to the Lord. That's possible. A, a saint is the greatest devotee. One who has oneness with the Lord is the greatest devotee of the Lord. Then you say, well, if he is one with the Lord, how can he be devoted to him? To be devoted, you require a you know hierarchy, <laughs> a higher and a lower. That is the culmination of devotion. When the lower is no more lower, it has become one with the higher. That is the culmination of devotion. This is said in the Bhagavad Gita. Again, I quote Chatur Vidha Bhajante Maam Ye Janaha Sukritor Juna. Lord says, that I have four types of devotees Artha Artharthi Jignyasu Gnani. <laughs> The first one, first guy comes to me also devoted, but he comes to me only when he is in trouble, you know. 
when things go wrong in his life, he, he starts <laughs> or goes to the temple, prays, remembers the Lord. Only when things don't go right. He is an Artha, Artha Bhakta, devotee in distress. Then the devotee in distress gets a little wiser in life. He thinks, you know, every time I was in distress, I prayed, things worked for me. Now, why not I move forward in life? Suppose I, I want to invest money somewhere. Suppose I can take Lord's help in that also. I can give him 10% to that church or that temple. And then maybe in my generosity, he will bless me, <laughs> have this business. So you begin to make deals with the Lord, you know. You do this for me and I'll do this for you. You help me this way, I'll give you that much, you know. This is called Artharthi Bhakta. He's also a devotee. But he uses Lord as his accomplice, you know, in achieving what he wants. Third type of devotee is one who doesn't want things from the Lord. He says, I've been taking from you all the time now. You are the all resourceful source. Why should I take things from you? Why not I just capture the resource person himself? <laughs> Why not he himself remain with me? Then I have all resources always. And therefore I want you, O Lord. He is a mumukshu, the third one. A spiritual seeker who seeks the Lord as his prime project in life. In search of the self, he seeks the Lord. Fourth devotee is one who doesn't seek anything anymore. He also prays, but prays in glorification of the Lord. Because he has become one with him. He has understood the secret. And Lord says in the second line, Lord, in the Gita, Udaraha sarva evaite jnani tu atmai vame matam. All four types of devotees are dear to me. All four, mind you, all four are dear to me. Because they seek me in some form or the other. But the fourth one is me. <laughs> all four are dear to me, but the fourth is me. I am him, he is me. That is the culmination of devotion. So for a spiritual seeker he's he moves from the third to the fourth his journey is from the third to the fourth he's done with one to two <laughs> he's from third to fourth is his journey <coughs> there's no he that's our journey that's your journey so in the very beginning i started the interview by asking who are you yes so is that the answer yes that fourth Fourth. You're that. Fourth. Jnani to Atme Vamehmatam. Yes. <laughs> That's what we all are. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we all are. Okay. Um, seekers often have curious ideas about the enlight enlightened state. Please describe your typical day and how you <laughs> perceive the world. <laughs> My typical day has nothing to do with, with, uh, with what I hold in me. The day is apparent, it's mithya. Each day has its character. You know, it's like the kaleidoscope. Have you ever seen through the kaleidoscope? You can never look at that same design again, you know. Each moment is a design frozen. <coughs> Has its own pattern, its own beauty, its own shape and form and color. Try to recreate it. Then you go back thinking if you go the other way, it will come back to the same, mm -hmm, never comes back to the same. So there is no typical day 
sorry if I disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> each day is new, each day is fresh. Each day has something to offer that the previous day I didn't even know existed. <laughs> and I live to, to my life, day-to-day -day living is what my life is, moment-to-moment -moment life. Rising to the moment is my life, that's all I would say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would just like to thank you that uh, by responding to a telephone call only yesterday afternoon, you're somehow um, exemplifying that moment to moment. Moment so to moment. I really it's thank really you for, for that. Yes. And the last question. Yes. <laughs> How happy everyone looks <laughs> to be relieved. <laughs> we'll just be in time for dinner. Okay. Um, you've given us a profound discourse on awakening. When you would meet someone with a passion for awakening, what would be your short advice? I don't think into the future. <laughs> I live in the moment. <laughs> in this moment, do you have any advice? <laughs> Unasked, I don't give advice. What advice would you like to have? In what context? I really said what I needed to say through your very, very beautifully um, placed questions. Is there anything else you'd like to <coughs> add, which I didn't ask you? I um, one thing I would uh, like to add is as a person who has lived in the Western world and in the Eastern world, um, been part of society and fallen out of society, <laughs> both you know out in the sense not as part of the regular stream of living. I do, uh, I do uh, want to say one thing that um, I have seen in my personal years of moving in the Western world and living with many Western seekers. Uh, my own Gurukulam where I studied Vedanta was in upstate California. And I had many American Gurubais who were staying with me. We were all together with our Guru learning. And we remained friends for a number of years. We are still in touch with some of them. What I mean to uh, say is, I find a lot of a very, very, very genuine search in those of you who come from the Western world to the Far East looking for answers. And the people I meet when I talk to them, everything that is said, everything that's given from the Indian side has is taken very much to heart, carried, you know, and uh, brought into life, however different, however alien the culture might be, the ways might be. I've seen a tremendous, tremendous capacity to really, <laughs> totally give your all and hope that things will work out and work towards that, of course. This is something very special about you. And you, I want you to understand it is special about you. Because that is the kind of Shraddha 
the faith that is sought by the tradition. But I also would like to alert you that one needs to also in one's um, search for deeper answers, spiritual answers, it is important that we understand our role of being simply good human beings. That prerequisite that I said, that's our own internal work. No guru can help in that, that's our work. And if I have been honest with myself, there is a, a self-dignity that one that should never have to be staked at the feet of anybody. No spiritual uh, tradition can ever say, you know, give me your all, including human respect, <laughs> including self-respect. And so, why I say this is because there has been a lot of abuse <laughs> from, from, the, from the Eastern cultures. People have posed to be teachers, people have, have, a, have taken people for a ride and so on. And years go by, and finally by the time you realize, you know, you, are, you were a hurt soul and now you are more hurt. And so one needs to always, Shraddha or faith means placing yourself, but trusting the person in front for knowledge. And for knowledge when we say, take, if that person can take you to yourself, you are with that soul. You learn, go back to yourself. Never, never pay a price for knowledge with your, with your human self-respect. If you find it ever crosses the boundary, the relationship, be honest and reflective enough to walk away from it, you know, so that you are not hurt in later years. Because I have also met some people in my travels where they no more understand what a guru is all about. And that's because they gave their all, you know. And giving your all means what? We have to understand what giving our all means. Giving our all doesn't mean giving your dignity, giving your, giving, you know, Giving, giving your, giving your trust so that the person gives me the knowledge. I have my viveka, vairagya, my uh, my humane qualities in place, my desire to know in place. It's all the fourfold four prerequisites. The prerequisites don't say you should massage the guru's feet. It doesn't say you should work twenty-four hours for his glory or ashram, that the institute, the, the, the tradition doesn't say. And therefore, it's very important <laughs> that we don't lose our thinking mind, reasoning mind, in being able to even understand things. When it comes to taking care, healing and so on, the West has solutions has come up with with certain process of psychological healing certain tools which are appropriate to you maybe for me parikrama going around the hill is required for healing maybe it's not required for you maybe it will work for me maybe it will not work for you because that's also cultural if it works for you wonderful if it doesn't work for you, doesn't mean you have to kill yourself for it. You know, the whole idea is to live. 
and grow into into this 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 beauty of life not to hurt yourself more and therefore you take tools which are appropriate to your culture to your tradition healing is not just all about spirituality is not just about healing spirituality is not just about getting over some abuses in childhood spiritual life is a lot more than that <laughs> spiritual life is seeing myself as free in spite of the abuses in spite of what happened to the body mind i am not the body mind sense complex self is free it was ever free self is untouched it was ever untouched that is spirituality and therefore the relative level of healing and so on is at a relative level there are tools in the worldly levels body mind level india has its tools the west has its tools i can take these tools those tools whichever works for me if you want to take purely western tools for your body mind healing go ahead nothing wrong but that's not the end of spirituality you heal and then come to spiritual life gain a maturity take care of your prerequisites being a good human being is not necessarily a spiritual life i can be good and have nothing got to do with spirituality i'm just a simple ethical human being ethical people need not be spiritual need not be religious even they are simply ethical nothing wrong spirituality takes something more than purely healing it takes lot more than purely being sane being mature it takes that deeper search for for freedom from a life of limitations and becoming spiritual life means discovering the self as being timeless being being free from the bondages of time and space that's the self i want to know myself to be that life taken is spiritual life up to that point we are working with the prerequisites it's all necessary for that ultimately and therefore integrating different tools is fine do whatever it takes in that mithya level relative level whichever works works there is no indian system alone that will work and the western system will not work i do not agree with that if i need to go for therapy i should go for therapy i cannot then say it is western and not indian i should have the honesty to take that or if it is girivalam parikrama that i need to do for my therapy then that's what my culture gives me and i can relax into that then that's what's right for me so these are just tools and let us not give them too much weightage and then and then suffocate under it you know because you all said and done you are born and brought up in the western world you have been raised with certain orientations certain certain ways of being what works for you what doesn't work and that's fine we respect you for that you need don't need to disown any of it in fact what spirituality should give you is add to that embellish that complete that cycle from that end i complete it from this end <laughs> we should be able to come together above cultures above above religion above culture above land and time and place frameworks civilization frameworks we are free from all of that <laughs> you see and therefore i need you to relax <laughs> into yourself into this country enjoy you are here you are very happy we really welcome you tiruvannamalai is is 
is, I don't know what to say, if I start talking, I might choke, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's the place uh, Premanandji could have brought you. It is no, no better place. The heart of the spiritual life is here at his feet. He knew where to land and so he keeps bringing his people here all the time. There is a reason for it. So you have proper guidance from him and at his feet you cannot go wrong. I trust that very much. And so just trust, be prayerful. And I'm sure you have a great, great life ahead in the spiritual world. <laughs> Fulfilling, healing with proper guidance. Okay, this, thank you all. <laughs>